to lives and purpose of life. And so we've been reflecting on this verse for a couple weeks. Romans chapter 12. That song was fitting to, to read this verse after singing that. Romans chapter 12 verse 1, it says this. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Let's pray. Our God and our fathers, uh, our Father, as we... Uh, we bow our heads and, and eyes and, and humble our hearts. I pray that we will. And I pray that there be a lot of attentiveness to the things that your word has to say as it will tell us what it means to serve you and to come to that decision in life. And I pray that you'd speak to hearts both old and young and that you would have your will and your way in their life as they consider what life is really about. And so speak to us through your word and by your spirit. And uh, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now this verse anticipates your salvation in that it says, I beseech you, brethren, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. It anticipates the fact that you've already studied the mercies of God, and the mercies of God is what brought you salvation is God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherein he loved us even while we were dead in sins yet has he quickened us being uh, saved by grace. That is God's great mercy is when we were dead in trespasses and sins Jesus Christ came and died on the cross to pay for our sins so that he might by his grace freely give us eternal life not based on works not based on you making a promise to do something or to change your life he reached down to the level you were at and in the condition you were in, dead in trespasses and sins, unprofitable, unuseful to God, having nothing to offer him whatsoever, and out of his great love for you, Christ came and paid for every sin that you've ever done, every offense you've ever done against God, and took those sins and nailed it to the cross and paid for it at the cross and, and became a propitiation for your sins at the cross so that God the Father could offer you, look through the blood of Christ and offer you eternal life as a free gift and is willing to save you if you just come to God through Christ by believing on Jesus Christ who died for you and rose again. Believe that he died and paid for the penalties of your sin. Believe that he died to become your Savior. And when you believe it, he is your Savior. The Bible says he's the savior of all men, especially they that believe. He's everyone's savior, but he's not, not everyone took advantage of, their, of his salvation and, and don't until they believe what he has done for them. Now, that's, that's what it means by the mercies of God. Now, we're long past that in our study and studied other things as well about God's grace and mercy. And uh, based on that, there's a challenge here about your life. And it's really about his life. That is, when you get saved, God puts his spirit within you, and the life that you have is the life of Christ dwelling in you. Uh, when sometime when we speak about life, we're talking about the time frame in which we walk planet Earth. And it's not necessarily your life. When you're saved, it's the life of Christ, and it's you that need to be a sacrifice of your wants, desires, and your will, your purpose, your goals, your ambition, to allow Jesus Christ to fulfill his will in his way in your life. And, and, and God is, uh, just like God doesn't force anyone to be saved, God leaves that choice to everyone. So it is that once you're saved, how and why you're going to live your life, it's a choice that you make. Jesus Christ wants to live through you, but he'll only do that as you present yourself uh, to God and as you present yourself as not only a living sacrifice but holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service. So we've been looking at this verse and being challenged by it. Uh, a couple weeks ago we talked about uh, a, a reasonable appeal. Then last week we looked at it and realized we're beseeched by mercies to, to present our bodies a living sacrifice. And today I want to talk to you about presenting yourself, uh, your, your bodies. Uh, as the verse says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. But just presenting your bodies and, and what that means to present. <laughs> you know, in the English language, that word, if it was not in a, that, the word present, if it was not in a context, it was just the English word 
present or spelled out that way. There's about four different definitions you could give to that word in English. But as it sits here, here it's talking about a presentation, to present yourself, your bodies, a living sacrifice. And, and that's a, a term that we're, we're familiar with in the sense that it, it actually means to put yourself at his disposal. It is, you know, sometimes someone, something happens to someone and you go and you say, if you need anything, just ask me. It's to offer your services. And, and that's what the idea there, present your bodies, a living sacrifice is. Is to offer your service to God, to yield yourself unto God. Look back at Romans chapter 6. It says in, in verse 11, it says, likewise, and this is likewise in, in understanding that when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, God puts you in His Son. He baptized you into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God the Holy Spirit did that. No man can do that. You're placed into Jesus Christ, not into water. And in Christ, you're died with Christ, you're buried with Christ, and you're alive with Christ. That's why we talk about the life that you have now is Christ's life. And so, based on the fact that you've been so identified with his death, burial, and his resurrection, the life you have is a resurrected life. It's the life of Christ. Verse 11 says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, and alive unto God through Jesus Christ, Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lusts thereof. Now we're talking about the mortal body. The mortal body is the body that's yet to put on immortality. It's the body that's subject to death. It's the body that, that the Bible says your outward man perishes. That's the, body, that's the mortal body. And verse 12 says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield your, ye yourself, your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God, as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So that word yield in those verses there, that's exactly what it means in Romans chapter 12 when it says, present yourselves a living sacrifice. Don't yield to the temptation of sin and let these, this body, this mortal body, and the members of this mortal body be a, a, a servant to sin, but yield yourselves and the members of your body, yield your body and, and the members of this body unto God as instruments of righteousness unto Him. Now, you know, all that kind of talks about you got to do something about the body you live in, doesn't it? And it's real helpful for me when I read verses like this, not only to understand what it means to present yourself, it's actually to, 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 to uh, stand ready to say, to say to God that I'm at your disposal, I'm at your will, I'm at your beck and call, whatever you want me to do, I'm willing to do it. Amen. Now, you know, by the way, don't get, don't get ahead of yourself and start thinking, oh, this means I've got to go here, I've got to go do that, and start worrying about all those things. No, all God's asking you to do is you realize what Christ has done for you. You realize the position God gave you in His Son that you'll never be separated from. You realize the dispensational change where God is using Gentiles. Israel used to be a servant. A Gentile could never offer himself to the service of God. When you read the servants in the Old Testament, it's always the nation of Israel. But in dispensational change, God has turned and saved us Gentiles and will use us too. And to present yourself is to put yourself at God's disposal, ready to do what he would have you to do. And in the weeks to come, we'll, we'll, we'll briefly, we're not in the detail, we've covered the, these chapters of Romans, but we'll look at some of the things that God says, okay, if you're my servant, here's what I want you to do. But right now, don't worry about what he wants you to do, just realize that there's a choice you need to make in life, and that is, what are you going to do with these members, this body that you walk around in? And uh, rather than yielding a sin, yield it unto God. And, and as I said, when, when I look at both Romans chapter 6, verses 11 through 12, if we're talking about the body as if it's not talking to the body. Now see, I might be talking to your brain right now, and you might be using the member, your ear, to hear what I have to say. But God's word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, as a discerner of the thought and intent of your heart. See, God's Word, the preaching of God's Word is a very special thing. You know it is because it's something different than just a Bible study. 
But the difference it is, is when you preach God's Word, God's Word is coming off the pages here, and it's going into your ear, and it's striking like a sword, your heart, and it's, it, and it's causing you to make some decisions about your life, your being. When I say you, you know who I'm talking to? I'm not talking to your ear. I'm not even talking to your brain. I'm talking about the soul that possesses that body. And you have a soul and a spirit. The spirit is the seed of your intellect. And when you get saved, God's spirit joins witness with your spirit. But the soul is the person that we're dealing with here. And you as, as an individual walking around in a body, you're going to use this body for something. Either for disgrace or it could be used for honor. Only if you're saved can it ever be used for honor. And, and so it's talking about, that, that's why it says in Romans 12 there, present your bodies a living sacrifice. You don't present your soul. Your soul's already been presented. Come over with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, it starts in verse 3, it says this. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. There's the presentation. God the Father has made, or God the Son has made it possible that you and I can always stand in the presence of God the Father holy and without blame before God the Father in love. And it's through the Lord Jesus Christ that that's made possible. Uh, as, as it goes on, it's, uh, it goes on to say, uh, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children, which is by Jesus Christ, to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted, in the Beloved, in whom ye have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Now, it's th what this is doing is listing all the blessings that you have in Christ. And you've been presented already before God the Father in Jesus Christ. And in Jesus Christ, you'll always stand before God the Father holy and without blame. You're already accepted in the Beloved. In Jesus Christ, you already have the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. And you have that because in Christ you have redemption. So, so when we talk about presenting yourself, you're not presenting your soul to God for acceptance. Your soul has been accepted. You've been saved. You're in Christ. And there's a presentation of Jesus Christ that way. Look, look at Ephesians 4. No, make it Ephesians 5. That's where I meant to go. It says in verse 1, Be followers of God as dear children. Now these are the children of God. And so if God is your father, follow him as a dear child. But how did you become a dear child of God? Well, it says in verse 2, Walk in love as Christ also loved us, and hath given himself for an offering, a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. See, in, in, in the Old Testament, Israel would offer animal sacrifices to God, and there's all kinds of instructions about burning that. And they'd offer that up, and it would ascend up into heaven. The sacrifice and the smell of the fire and the burning would ascend up into heaven, and that, that God would accept those people. He'd be pleased by the sacrifice that they did. Now, he was actually pleased back then because they were faithful to offer the sacrifice he required. But the one who fully satisfied God, that God, a holy God, could look at sinful men and, and see them through a sacrifice and be well well pleased with, with mankind, that, that a sweet smelling savor, a sacrifice that pleased him, is when Jesus Christ gave himself. There's someone who gave himself a sacrifice, a living sacrifice. The Lord Jesus Christ, he died for us, and then he pleased God. Our acceptance of our soul is through Jesus Christ. That's already been taken care of. What Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 12 is that now you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Your, say, your soul has been saved and already accepted by God because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. Uh, while you're here, look at chapter 5 and look at uh, verse 25. Just describing how a husband is to love his wife. 
and it uses Christ's example of his love for us. Husbands, verse 25 of Ephesians 5, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself, what kind? A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives. Men ought to love their wife like Christ loved us. I, I, I want your attention to go and how much Christ loved us. That he went and he died on the cross. He gave himself for us so that he could cleanse us and present the church to himself, a glorious church without any spot or wrinkle. So there is a presentation that's already taken place. That's not the presentation I'm talking about today. But if you're here without knowing salvation, knowing what Jesus Christ has done for you, or have never trusted in what Jesus Christ has done for you, then, then you need to come to God through Christ. Don't be offering your bodies a living sacrifice unto God, because if you're not saved, He never asked you to do that. And He wouldn't do it because you've got to be holy and without blame to, to serve. You've got to present yourself in a certain way, and first of all, you have to be sanctified by the blood of Christ. Then you set your, your sinful life aside and, and serve the Lord with a, with a pure heart as well. But first you need to be saved. But those of us who are saved, we're talking about presenting our bodies a living sacrifice. Now I've shared this before. Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now actually my goal is to give you several challenges from the Old Testament and we'll cover whatever enough time we can squeeze in in this time. And, and I trust that the testimony, first the, the doctrinal teaching first, and then the testimony from examples of the Old Testament will indeed speak to your heart. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Corinthians were actually being involved in fornication. And Paul is rebuking them, believers who thought it was okay to fornicate. Now hopefully you're not that ignorant in your Christian life. And, uh, and Paul had to rebuke them, so you can be. A lot of times people think that Christians don't commit sins that the rest of the world commits. There is no sin that the rest of the world commits that a Christian can't commit. Because we live in bodies of flesh, and these bodies of flesh are sinful bodies. Unless you decide to yield it as instrument of righteousness unto God. You can allow sin, and you can let these bodies be a servant to sin. But, but God, who saved your soul is speaking to your soul about the use of your body and he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19 what 1 Corinthians 6 19 what do I got you in the right place? <laughs> I'll go on. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which which is in you which ye have of God and ye are not your own I can't read this verse without remembering a Christian brother one time who said, I don't really believe the Holy Spirit possesses us. I mean, how can you read that verse any other way? Your body is the temple of Holy Ghost. Okay, maybe that doesn't mean he's in you. Which is in you. <laughs> I mean, I, see, if you're saved, God has put his Holy Spirit within you. Your body is like a temple. God used to meet with Israel. There was a place, the holy place inside that temple, and God would meet with them. His presence would be right there. Today, God has no temples. God today dwells within the believer, and the Holy Spirit, his, the third person of the Trinity, comes and possesses your soul, makes, bears witness with your spirit, and dwells inside this body that you're walking around in. And so your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God. And notice that in the last phrase. And ye are not your own. Now last week we stressed about the fact about you never living your life the way you want it to live. Satan is trying to manipulate you, and you need to yield yourself unto God. Uh, but, but here, you, you need to be a, a reminder of the opposite of that. Is not only a Satan trying to lead you, but you don't belong to yourself. You're not your own. Verse 20 says, For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. They belong to God. Now there's three parts of your being. Paul says, I pray that God would sanctify you wholly, your whole spirit, soul, and body, be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. What happened to your soul in that verse? 
Well, see, I read that verse, and it's just like when I read Romans, and it says, present your bodies, he's talking to the soul. You, the soul. You have a spirit, and you have a body. And you're the soul in between all that. And whether your spirit's going to listen to what God's spirit has to say, and then your soul's going to make a decision, that's where your will's at, how this flesh is going to be used. Or your spirit can listen to the spirit of the world, the spirit of Satan, demons, and your soul will make a decision to, to live that way, and your body becomes an instrument of unrighteousness. See, you belong to the Lord, now glorify God in your body and in your spirit, both things. Your body and your spirit. So, you're the soul that it's talking to, and, and now you need to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. You need to glorify God in the body, but also in the spirit. That's important because, come to 2 Corinthians. Look at chapter 11. Second Corinthians 11, verse 2. And this is just a hair ahead of where we're going to be. You actually learn this, this, what we're going to teach right now from Romans 12, verse 2. But, but look, look what it says. Uh, chapter 11, verse 2, it says, and I'm in 2 Corinthians, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now this is Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, who took the gospel of, of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, and so the Gentiles could be saved, and Paul's message is the message of the Gent for the Gentiles. Other people were coming along at Corinth and saying, you know, you, you guys talk about Paul so much, listen to what I got to say. And began to challenge the things that Paul was saying, but only the things Paul was saying were coming from God. And they're, they're the way that you could be presented to God as a chaste virgin, as a cleansed virgin. The washing of water by the word, the word of God to you is the message that, Paul, that God sent through the apostle Paul to us Gentiles. But the Corinthians began to listen to other people and Paul says, I'm jealous with a godly jealousy. Like you're departing from God if you're listening to these other people. He says in verse 3, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted. Now notice your minds. Your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. That is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom, whom we have not preached. And you've got to realize, Paul preached not Jesus Christ as the Messiah to Israel that came to set up the kingdom, but as the Savior of the Gentiles to form the body of Christ. He preached Jesus in a different way. Or if you receive another spirit which ye have not received. That is, that, that's, not, that's not like they received a demon spirit. That is, they are receiving a whole other message than the message God sent to them. It's not the message of God. They're not, they're not sanctifying, they're not keeping God holy in their body and in their mind, in their spirit. Or if you receive another gospel, which, we have, which uh, ye have not accepted, ye may well bear with him. Someone preaches some, some other message, Paul's jealous that they might bear with them. And, and what you have in 1 Corinthians 11 is different than 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6, he's challenging them to present their bodies holy unto God. That glorify God in your body, but he also said glorify God in your spirit. That's 2 Corinthians. Because now here they're, they're listening to someone else. They're listening to another, another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel that's not the one God sent to the Gentiles. You can't, you can't present yourself a living, you can't be a servant of God with the wrong message. You can yield your, your bodies an instrument unto God, but if you carry the wrong message, you're not going to glorify God. In order for you to glorify God, you must glorify Him in body and in spirit. They belong to God just like your soul does. So, but also in this passage, uh, Paul, when he, when he says, I have espoused you unto one husband that I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul presented you, didn't he? He took the body of Christ, those who believed his message, and he's working with them because he wants to present them to Jesus Christ in a pure fashion, with pure doctrine and pure lives. Come over with me, to first of all, to 2 Chronicles. Look, look at chapter 16. I, I can't talk about this doctrine without this verse coming to my mind. 2 Chronicles. Now we're going to look at some Old Testament passages here. 
2 Chronicles chapter 16. And look at verse 9. I'll give you the context after I read the verse. 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. And make sure everyone's listening at this point. Look at this verse. It says, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Here, in, and the, the prophet is actually talking to Asa the king. He says, Herein hast thou done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. Now I'll explain what Asa did. But you know that verse is an interesting verse. You ever wonder what God does in heaven? Does God scan this whole universe, this whole earth? Not the universe, the earth. And look to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for a person whose heart is perfect toward him, that he might show himself uh, strong in that man's life, that woman's life. See, when, when I'm over there thinking about Romans and it says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, it's like God is just standing there scanning, okay, who's listening? Who's going to do it? That's the one I'm going to use in this world. Yield yourselves as instruments of righteousness unto God. God's waiting. He's looking. He's scanning. How, how, how far does he have to look? Does he look past you? Or does I stop on you and say, there's one? See, Asa, this is an interesting passage. One that you should just go study on your own. But, but Asa is a king that when he was first king, when he was first reigning. Look, look back at chapter 14. Look at verse 9. It says, it says, there came out against him Zerah the, uh, the, the Ephraimite, Ethiopian, with a host of a thousand thousand and three hundred chariots, and came to uh, Maresha. And so Asa, he prepares for battle. In verse 11 it says, And Asa cried unto the Lord his God, and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord, our God, for we rest on thee, and in thy name we go against this multitude. O Lord, thou art our God, let not men prevail against thee. And so the Lord smote the Ethiopian before Asa. So, this guy, he's, he's outnumbered, they got chariots, but he says, you know, it don't matter how many people they have and how weak we might be, if the Lord's with us, we'll just trust in the Lord, and the Lord brings the victory in his life. But when you come over to chapter 16, it says in verse 1, In the sixth and thirtieth year of the reign of Asa, Basha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah, to the intent that he might let none go, go out or come in to, king, uh, to Asa, the king of Judah. Then Asa... Besought, uh, brought out the silver and gold out of the treasuries of the house of the Lord and out of the king's house and sent it to ba ba uh, Ben Haddon, king of Syria that dwelt in, in Damascus, saying, Let's make a league, you come and help me. The northern kingdoms of Israel started to give a conflict to the southern kingdoms of Judah, and this time Asa, rather than saying, Oh, well, we'll just count on the Lord to help us. He actually takes the, the gold, the wealth, out of the, out of the temple of God and sends it to a Gentile king north of, the kingdom, north of Israel, Damascus, Syria, and asks the king, you come and help us. So the king takes the money, comes down, wipes out the northern tribes. Asa had his deliverance, but his deliverance didn't come from the Lord. And that's where the prophet, in verse 7 it says, and at, at that time, Han, Han, Hananiah, the, the seer, came to Asa the king, and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria. Verse 8 says, Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubans a, a huge host, and very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst not rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. Uh, he delivered them into thy hand, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro. You know what that, that perfect heart is that the Lord is looking for? One that doesn't care about numbers, doesn't care about abilities and powers. Just will, a man who will do what God said to do and pay the cost. Just trust in the Lord. You know, 
I would tell you this, because I know it by experience. Why doesn't every believer yield themselves unto God as a living sacrifice? If it's only reasonable, he loved us, he died for us, he saved us, he wants to get sin out of our life, why wouldn't we yield ourselves unto God? You know why? It's one thing to trust him for your salvation to make sure you don't go to hell. It's another thing to trust him with your life. You actually have reservation. Oh, if I serve the Lord, he's gonna, my life's going to be miserable. It's going to be a terrible, boring life. I know better than God. That's, I, you won't say that to yourself. I would never say it to myself either. But that's really the reason. Oh, there's some things I need to experience, things I want to do in life. I want to really find out if sin is really all that bad. Now, you don't say that to yourself, but that's really going on in your head. God wants to show himself strong in those who would just trust him, just rest in him. Why would you think God who loved you and died for you would want anything but the best for your life? Why, why would you think that you couldn't trust him with all the experiences that you're going to face in the future? All the decisions that you're going to have to go through, all the conflicts you're going to have to go through, that his way is the right way, and you just all you got to do is just trust in his word and do what he says. And you might have hard times, there's no doubt about that. But we're reluctant to do that. Let me give you some illustrations of presentation. Well, because it's Mother's Day, we're squeezing this one in. Go to 1 Samuel. It's actually back... It, it, You've got 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. So go all the way back to 1 Samuel, all the way back to the first chapter. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, it says in verse 1, that there was a certain man of, well, there's a big one, Ramathia, Ramathium Zophim <laughs> of Mount Ephraim, and I, also I can get to his name, his name was uh, Elkanah. So you got this man Elkanah, notice in verse 2, he had two wives. So he has two wives, one's Paniah and the other one's uh, Hannah, and, uh, and, and Paniah has... Uh, she has children. Hannah has no children. Uh, it says down in verse 4, And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Paniah his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But to, to Hannah he gave a, a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. So, you know, the Bible does allow polygamy. God didn't teach it, but he regulated it. Man invented it. It's not the way in God's design God gave Adam one wife. He didn't give him two wives. It's not God's design. But God, man in his own wisdom, goes ahead. You realize the conflict? I mean, if you read the details here, you realize a man has two wives. He's got big problems. <laughs> Especially one's having children, the other one isn't. Now they have, they have all kinds of emotional problems on top of that. So, but, but anyhow, the, the attention goes to Hannah here because she is, she is uh, in conflict here. It says over in verse 10, it says, And she was in bitterness, now she goes off, they're, they're down in Jerusalem offering the sacrifice at the time. They're not from there, but they're in, in Jerusalem. So she goes into the temple, and she's all by herself, and it says, And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept so, sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaiden, and remember me, and not forget, forget thine handmaiden, but will give unto thine handmaiden a man-child. Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Now that, that idea of no razor coming, Numbers chapter 6, when a person uh, is, gives a Nazarite vow. Now here's Hannah making her son, that if God gives her a son, he's going to be a Nazarite. Now, that, what a Nazarite vow is, is that it, they, the whole, it, it, they, have long, they never cut their hair because it's a, sh a form of, it's a show of servitude, that you're a servant. Not allowed to drink any, not even grape juice, forget about wine and strong drink, but not even allowed to drink grape juice. Now, a lot of times people think Jesus Christ had long hair because they say, oh, he was a Nazarite. No, he was a Nazarene. <laughs> a Nazarene is a man who grew up in Nazareth. 
But a Nazarite is a person who took a vow. That's why they paint Jesus Christ with long hair. He didn't have long hair. He wasn't a Nazar uh, Nazarite. He was a Nazarene. But anyhow, this is what she means by that. So she's praying to the Lord. And it came to pass, as, as she continued praying before the Lord, Eli, you know, he's the priest in the temple, marked her mouth. Now, Hannah spake in her heart, only her lips moved. But her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought that she had been drunk. Drunken. Now, you know, he's not one to judge. You read about his life and his kids' lives, but he's quick to judge her. But you know, that's an interesting verse for me because the Bible says only God knows your heart. And I don't know how often you pray and, and how you pray. There's times that you need to pray out loud. Not everything's a secret prayer in your life. I mean, certainly when we come together as a group, we pray out loud for the benefit of everybody. But sometimes even when you're by yourself, it's not bad, it's not a bad idea to pray out loud once in a while. Uh, I, another story about that, but I'm not going to there. <laughs> but I do want to assure you that if you just pray with your head bowed, silently thinking and directing your conversation and your thought to the Lord, He does hear you. That is prayer. I mean, here's a testimony of that. Uh, the Lord's going to hear her prayer, but, but Eli thought he's drunk, she was drunk, and when he finds out he's not, then he apologizes and, and, and kind of, uh, he, he blesses her, and, and, and so she, she goes home. Verse 19 it says, and they rose up early in the morning, uh, they, they rose up in the morning, and worshiped before the Lord, and returned and came to their house in Ramah, and, and, uh, and Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come, uh, came, uh, was come about, after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. Now this lady did a very honorable thing. She, she asked, for the Lord, asked him of the Lord, and she said that if you give me a, uh, a child, I'm going to give him back to you. That came at a time, if you're reading through the time of the judges, how far Israel is departing from God. And when you read 1 Samuel, you read about Eli and his sons, the priesthood, how they're actually corrupting the people rather than making the people more spiritual. God raised up Samuel the prophet just at the right time to begin to speak and minister to the nation of Israel. And this Samuel is the one that's born of Hannah here. Now, it says over in verse uh, 24, and when... Uh, she told her husband, I'm not going back to Jerusalem anymore until the child is ready to be left there. And it says, and when she had weaned him, she took him uh, with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. Now, if she just weaned him, how young do you think this child was? <laughs> six or less, it could be three or less, but uh, I, I'm not sure, I, I, he could be as, as young as three years old, but, and it says the child was young, verse 25 says, and they slew the bullock and brought the child to Eli, and she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord, for this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I have asked him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And, and he worshiped the Lord there. Now, she is actually, what you're realizing here is she brings him to Eli, and when they go home, she leaves that child with Eli the priest and goes home. He's given to the Lord and to the service of the Lord. And, and it's a, a, a time because he's the only one that ever represents the Lord. The Lord at a young age begins to speak to Samuel as a prophet. When you read in your Bible it says, From Samuel and all who followed after have likewise foretold of these days. God raised up Samuel when he started a whole era of speaking to Israel through the prophets. Not through the law, but now through the prophets. And that marks a real important time. And Eli was a, a, uh, excuse me, Samuel was a prophet from a very young age. And, and here God begins to use Samuel, but Hannah, you talk about a living sacrifice, didn't have a child. Tells God, if you give me a child, I'll give him back to you. Maybe as young as three years old, leaves him at the temple and said, now you listen to Eli and you serve the Lord. And I'll see you every year, every three, every three uh, feast days when I come down, I'll come and see how you're doing. 
So she didn't, did not see him anymore, but he spent the rest of his years growing up. The, the final thing that Samuel did, he's the one who anointed David to be king of Israel. So God used Samuel in a, in a very mighty way, but that phrase, she lent him to the Lord. Now, I, I say that because she, for a mother to give up a child to the Lord, not a, not a sacrifice of dead, a living sacrifice. What a sacrifice that was. Especially when she didn't have any other children. By the way, look, look over chapter three, 2, verse 21. It says, And the Lord visited Hannah, so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. And the, Sam, and, and, and the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Now, we use this passage of scripture to show dedication. A lot of times people say, we had a baby, we'd like to dedicate it to the Lord. And sometimes people call me and say, do you believe in dedication or do you do dedications? And I do. Uh, I, when my child children were born, both of them, there was a time where we actually stood before our congregation and said, we're going to make sure we raise our children properly the way that God said to raise them. We ask you to pray for us that we do it. And we re read a passage like this, that we realize this child's not ours. That they're lent to us from God to raise. Now, Hannah lent him to the Lord, how long? For the rest of his life. But you know, she had those other five kids. Do you think those other five kids have less of a duty than Samuel did? They're going to be used in a different capacity. But she has a responsibility. But the point is, is that any child we have, just like you're not your own, moms, your children don't belong to you. They're lent to you. And you need to give them up for the Lord. But see, that's, you got Paul saying, I want to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. You got Hannah who took Samuel there and said, Samuel, serve the Lord. But you know, every person has to make an individual choice about themselves. Before, before I talk about that individual choice, it's amazing how sometimes parents can hinder a child from serving the Lord. Good Christian parents. See, I went to Bible college, and in Bible college, you meet people that come from all different walks of life. My parents were thrilled. I was in Bible college, because I was down in Fort Lauderdale, where my friends were going the opposite way of the world. <laughs> Not toward the Lord, but away from them. But, but, so they were glad I went to Bible college. But in Bible college, one of my best friends was a guy who was the, either number one or number two cross-country runner for the state of Ohio in his senior year of high school. He had scholarships. He could just pick any college he wanted to go to. His parents wanted him to go there and was encouraging him to go and were going to buy him a car when he went to college, a brand new car. He got saved. Now, I'm not sure what his parents' status was, but he got saved and, and he got challenged about his life, what he was going to do with his life, and you're just going to run around a track all your life, get awarded prizes and study secular things. That, you know, that nothing wrong with studying secular things. It's, it's what you do with what you know. But anyhow, he made a choice that, during that summer and he went to Bible college. And his dad said, if you go to Bible college, I'm never going to give you that car. Now, right now, it don't sound like a big deal to me, but you know, back then, to have a brand new car, even to have a used a junkie car was a great thrill. <laughs> but he turned, down that, he turned down that brand new car, turned down every scholarship, because cause he chose that he wanted to honor the Lord, and he knew he needed to grow. And now you can grow right in the church, <laughs> Hopefully, but I'm, in his church, maybe he couldn't. So he went away to Bible college. But here his parents were working against him. Now, it's a hard thing for parents to give up. You know, you talk about, now, women can serve the Lord as Becky wants to, and, 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 and Dawn wants to both. <laughs> they, they, I, I don't know about Becky. I know Dawn is actually thinking about staying single. I don't know if all her life, she's certainly planning to stay single right now. And so she can serve the Lord and be free to do so. 1 Corinthians 7 tells her to do that if she can. But you know, some women serve the Lord by getting married. Some people don't ever want their daughter to marry a preacher. You know, to, to go into the ministry, is, unless, unless you're in a denominational group where they're going to pay you real big, there's a lot of sacrifice. And sometimes parents don't want to see their daughter, oh, I, I, it's not true, and my, my mother-in-law is great. <laughs> but I know, other, I know other pastors that their mother-in-laws resent them because their daughter married a pastor, and they're poor, and they can never make much money, and don't have a lot of material things. And the mothers hate the man, that, that, that their, their son-in-law, because their daughter was given to that son-in-law. But see, 
I, I read a passage like this and realize, parents, you might want the best. You might want them to grow up to be doctors and lawyers or whatever. But the best thing you could do, if they're going to be a doctor or a lawyer, that they first give themselves to the Lord. Then those other things come second. And if they decide to live a life of poverty and mission work and, and, uh, and, and, and not have much of, the, of this world's goods, you need to be able to let them go. Let's end with Isaiah chapter 1. I, I have much more to say on a personal level because what I've done is kind of present about presenting your body as a living sacrifice. Paul wanted, wants us to be presented a certain way and he worked hard to present us that way. Hannah presented Samuel a certain way. But Romans 12 says present your bodies a living sacrifice. And we'll close with a personal testimony of exactly what that's about. In Isaiah chapter 6 is where I want you to be. Isaiah chapter 6. It says in verse 1, In the year that Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the th a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Now this is Isaiah the prophet. A king dies, and you wonder what's going to happen to the country, and you look up, and there's the Lord. And you're seeing the Lord. Isaiah says down in verse 5, I said, Woe is me, for I am, a man, I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, and mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of glory. You know why he says, Woe is me? No man's ever seen God and lived. Now he's seen a personification of God. He's seeing the Lord Jesus Christ reigning is what he's seeing. But Isaiah realizes to stand before a holy God, oh, I'm going to die. And an angel takes a coal off the altar, puts it on his lips, and says, you've been purified, you're not going to die. Jesus Christ was the sweet-smelling sacrifice so that we can stand before God the Father and be presented to him someday. But that's not just someday. I'm talking about today. The Lord, down in verse, down in verse 8, it says, I also heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. Have you ever said that to the Lord? You know, this world, they're lost in sin. I hope you're saved. But if you're saved, we're a bunch of group of saved people. You're going to go back out into the world, and there's all kinds of people on their way to hell, confused by religion, confused just by atheism, confused by ignorance. They're lost. God's will is all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God says, present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service. Have you heard God? God says, who will I send? Who will go for me? Isaiah stepped forward and he said, here am I. Send me. I'll tell you that if you'll tell that to, to God, not tell him where you'll go, what you'll do, just say, here am I, send me. If you do that, God will use you. But God doesn't force his way into your life. God doesn't use you uh, a, a, a apart from your will. God is looking for those who will present themselves a living sacrifice. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for allowing different verses of Scripture come together to challenge our life. And then, Father... Even in my prayer, I can hear myself saying it wrong. It's not our life, it's yours. We're bought with a price. And so, Father, we do pray, be glorified in our body and our spirit, which belong to you. And thank you for saving our soul. In Christ's name we pray, amen.